Oh, well, I mean, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear before, but this is just totally unacceptable and appalling. And again, I want to reiterate that I should not have overlooked uh, the past history around this. And so I think with the, uh, this very swift action that we're taking less than a week after this came to light, five days after it came to light, shows how seriously we take this, shows what standard we have for council members, and hopefully sends a message to the press about how we at the council, how myself as a leader, how the body as a whole uh, takes seriously things of this nature. Juan Manuel. Peter, I just spoke to uh, Council Man Rodriguez about now having also issued a request for the I have not. I, the staff here has, but I have not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can talk about anything, but yes, Noah. You mentioned all the various changes in this that you can expect to be going into the coming year. Yes. Were any of those changes also made at the behest of a single council member, like this committee was created Let me think for a second, because I don't want to give you inaccurate information. Um, there were multiple, I'm thinking on the fly here, and it happened a while ago, so don't hold me exactly to this, but I want to answer your question. There were multiple members who had the same preference for certain committees. So there were multiple members that wanted to chair the Transportation Committee. There were multiple members that wanted to chair the Education Committee. And when multiple members couldn't chair a single committee, we tried to come up with additional options. So I, I don't think Councilmember Rivera's first choice was to chair a new committee on hospitals, but she has a significant number of hospitals in her district. And we thought that that was a good opportunity to create that for her, given the importance of the Health and, Ho Health and Hospitals Corporation, what's been happening at the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and with the other hospitals in New York City. That's sort of one example of us creatively trying to create an opportunity on something that made sense. That's one thing that I can think of. Um, I can't think of any other examples besides that, but I'm happy to, if I think of anything, or if you have further questions, we're happy to have Jen um, get back to you and answer it for you. Yes. Um, so the previous issue of it not being a process or procedure was an issue with council in which uh, Councilman Diaz should be expelled, and do you think that he should be expelled? I think that he should resign. I've been very clear about that. There is a process. It's in the rules of the council. Um, the the discipline could be anything from you know a warning all the way to expulsion. I'm not going to prejudge. Uh, any potential process that is occurring, um, the the body as a whole will make that decision. Okay, anything, Summer? So you're are you endorsing the Supreme Court without this vote? Uh, I, I have said for a while I don't plan to make an endorsement in the public advocates race, but you know things could change. But that's not my plan. What brought you to the desk today that might be part of your resignation? Well, um, my. Uh, what is it, six weeks so far as acting public advocate um, has actually been more work than I imagined, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Um, the public advocate's office uh, gets a lot more constituent complaints than I realized on a day-to-day -day basis. The incredible staff at the public advocate's office and the folks here at the council who have been um, helping out at the public advocate's office during this period have been bombarded by complaints, um, constituent cases and issues. And I have uh, been over at the public, ad public advocate's office on uh, numerous visits to talk to the staff, meet with the staff, get the casework in order. So I actually think the, the casework is a much bigger aspect of the job than I ever realized. And I think former public advocate Betsy Gopbaum uh, has been really the the siren song on talking about the ombudsman aspect at, as the charter granted. One potential thing to look at is given that 311 is supposed to be the central nerve system of constituent complaints in New York City, I think having a conversation about the public advocate having a role in 311 would be an important conversation to have. Yesterday, thank you for being the only reporter who covered the Copic hearing uh, that we had. Go Gotham Gazette. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that's an important thing. So I, I, I can't 
I can't stand here today and, and name every quality, but I'll say that there are a lot of talented people that are running. Uh, I know almost every person uh, that's running. I'm going to make sure that whoever's elected, uh, that we give them a detailed briefing memo on what we've been working on for six or seven weeks, and I'm happy to work with them. I believe in independent budgeting. Um, I don't think that the public advocate's office should have a budget that relies upon the mayor and the city council. It's a, it's a check and balance in government, just like I believe other parts of government should have independent budgets. So I think there are conversations to be had about how to enhance the role of public advocate, and whoever's elected, I'm happy to work with them and brief them on the COPIC hearing that we had yesterday. Uh, Jill. Uh, have you spoken with Councilmember Diaz at all? I, I know I've been listening to the episode for a while. Have you spoken to him today? Do you expect him to show up today? Or? I have no idea if he's coming. Uh, as I said yesterday, the last time, the only time I spoke to him was on Friday afternoon when uh, Juan Manuel Benitez gave um, Jen the uh, transcript of the radio show, and I literally had no information besides what Juan had given us, and I called Councilmember Diaz in that moment that I got it, and we had uh, about a five-minute conversation, and I have not spoken to him since then. He called me on Sunday. Uh, I did not return the phone call. Samantha. I don't know if the public advocate has a formal role in that process, and I'm sure that whoever the public advocate is will say their opinion. Um, one of the roles of public advocate, besides being the ombudsperson for the city, is that they have a bully pulpit to talk about anything. Um, so I'm sure whoever the next public advocate is will have a position on that and talk about it. But I mean, it's a state uh, equivalency guideline. I know there's been talk of DOI potentially looking into yeshivas. The Department of Education has looked at yeshivas. I don't know what the next public advocate will do. Yes. I think the public advocate needs a bigger budget. Yeah. Bridget. Well, I grew up about 20 miles south of New Hampshire, and uh, every summer we vacationed in the White Mountains in New Hampshire um, as a child, so I love the state of New Hampshire. I brought Al Sharpton to New Hampshire in 2004 when he was running for president, uh, which he loves to remind me of, and so uh, New Hampshire has a great place in my heart. Kevin right here, who works in the press office, is a New Hampshire political veteran, uh, so I don't know. I, w I wish the mayor well wherever he travels. Um, you know, I, I know he's excited to talk about some of the things that um, he feels proud about for the city. I'm going to continue to focus on being speaker of the New York City Council. And as you could tell from this press conference, it is a full time job uh, that uh, doesn't stop. And I have a lot on my plate. So I am really just thinking about getting through this hearing today. I'm getting back to the work that this body does every single day and focused on myself. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if there are more people running for public advocate or president of the United States at this point, uh, but you know, I am uh, eating popcorn and sipping tea from the sidelines, watching it all unfold. Anyone else? Thank you, Thank you very much.